I'm Daughter of Darkness. Welcome to the family. Souls keep coming back again and again. Whether they're waiting to be born, have just crossed over, are earthbound spirits, or are only seen and remembered by a chosen few, they never really die, just change forms. Be sure to join me here every Thursday at 5 p.m. Central for new content. And if you'd like to hear more stories like this, click on the end screen or in the pinned comment below. The great gods of YouTube will be very happy if you do so. But for now, sit back, relax, let me lead the way, and let's get scared together, 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 together. I'm a nurse, and once we had a little boy, a toddler, come into our hospital by ambulance. After a few days, his condition became life-threatening, so we called his parents in the middle of the night. Before his parents arrived, the boy kept talking about his baby sister Hannah. Soon after that, he died. Fast forward to two years ago. This same family came into the hospital with their sick infant daughter. They remembered me and I remembered them. Their baby daughter's name was Hannah. Well, that startled me, because I recalled with clarity the little boy speaking about his baby sister Hannah, whom I assumed was alive and living at home two years ago. But no, Hannah hadn't even been conceived yet when her big brother was talking about her right before his own death. Thankfully, Hannah got better, went home with her parents, and is doing well today. But I'll never forget that little boy and his baby sister, Hannah, whom he knew about on the other side, even before she entered this world. This happened eight years ago. My husband and I were in bed one night watching TV. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a child in the doorway of our bedroom. Thinking it was our only child at the time, two-year-old Connor, I whispered to my husband, Hey, I think Connor's going to try to scare us. We watched in silence, soon realizing that this was not our son. He walked in with his head slightly tilted back, curls bouncing as he walked, and his diaper making that squishing sound that plastic makes when it rubs against your skin. He walked to the foot of our bed, then crouched down out of our line of sight. And when we got up to look, he was gone. I looked at my husband and said, Did we just see a ghost? Then, almost as an afterthought, I said, Well, now we know if we have another baby, he'll have curls, and he came to visit us before he was born. We both laughed because at that time we were not planning on having more children. But a few months later, surprise, I got pregnant. Fast forward a few years, and our new baby Liam was two. He walked into the room one night, head slightly tilted back, curls bouncing as he walked, and his diaper making that same squishy noise that plastic does when it rubs against your skin. It hit me like a bucket of ice water in my face. Holy crap, this is the baby that came to visit us three years ago. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind. On top of that, whenever Liam stays overnight somewhere else, like at my parents' house, he comes to visit me in my sleep, like in my dreams or astral projection. I'm not sure what it is. For example, one time he came to me and just smiled while I was taking a nap. He was wearing a little red shirt and his hair was short, but when he left home the day before to spend the night at my parents, he had long hair. The next day when I went to pick them up, Lo and behold, Liam's hair was freshly cut, and he was wearing that same little red shirt from my dreams. Mom had taken him for a haircut without telling me. So I asked her, was he wearing that same little red shirt yesterday? She said that yes, he had, but he insisted on wearing it again today. I walked over to him and asked, did you come to see Mama yesterday in her dreams? He looked up at me, his big blue eyes all serious, and he just nodded yes. He was four years old at the time. So that's my story, one of many. I guess our son is an astral traveler who even came to visit us before he was born. For me, 
utterly fascinating. When I was 11 years old, I came home from school and discovered my uncle face down in a pool of blood. He had killed himself with a shotgun. Years later, when I was 14 or 15, I was alone in the house on a Saturday morning. My parents had gone to my brother's baseball game, and I was just kicking back watching cartoons with my dog, when all of a sudden she started barking and growling at the stairs. So I walked over to have a look. There is a landing halfway up that blocks the rest of the view. My dog was right by my side, pressing up against me and growling. She wouldn't go ahead of me, but she also wouldn't leave my side. So together, we climbed up to the landing to see what was at the top of the stairs. And that's where I saw him. A full-bodied apparition of my dead uncle. He was standing at the top, just outside of the room where he had killed himself. He appeared completely solid, wearing the same clothes he had on when he died. My dog was going crazy. At first, I was blown away. How awesome was this? My uncle was back. He smiled and reached out to me, as though he were trying to give me something. I went further up the stairs, wanting to see what he had in his hand. But as I reached out to touch him, I was suddenly frightened, and I realized, Oh my God, I'm seeing a ghost. This is not possible. The moment I started to panic, my uncle frowned, withdrew his hand, and started to fade away. When he was gone completely, my dog stopped barking. I was very disappointed in myself. If I hadn't gotten scared, he would have spoken to me. I had blown my one chance and deeply regretted letting my fear get the better of me. About ten years later, I was hanging out with some friends and we were discussing life after death. They asked me if I thought it was possible to communicate with the dead. I told them my story, adding that I believed if a person is open-minded, it is possible, but that fear probably shuts it down, and most people are scared, so they cut themselves off from it. I told them how deeply I regretted getting scared, because I felt that my uncle had a message for me that he didn't get to impart. That night, I had an extremely vivid dream. In it, my uncle came to see me. He apologized for putting the family through the trauma of his death. He knows now that it was a mistake and a terrible thing to have done. He said that, despite the fact that he had committed suicide, he's not stuck here as a ghost, but that he chose to become one. His job now is to go around and help all the other spirits that committed suicide and who are stuck to cross over. He said he was confused and in pain when he killed himself, so now he helps other spirits who are stuck in that same frame of mind to find peace like he did after death. He said he's happy doing that work to atone for what he did and to please tell his wife and kids not to worry about him. He wanted them to know he's doing well. So, at the next family gathering, I did pass that message on to his wife. I could see the fear in her eyes as I spoke, and when I was finished, she didn't say another word to me for the rest of the evening, and she hasn't spoken to me since. So once again, fear shuts down communication. Sad, but true. I have a twin brother, and we both remember a guy called Uncle Jojo. He was an old guy, and I can picture him so clearly in my mind. And when my brother and I describe him to one another, we remember him exactly the same. We also both remember that he was missing his right index finger and that half of his middle finger was gone. We have very vivid memories of him taking us to the lake and buying us food. He taught us how to make a tire swing, which is still there by the lake, and we remember helping him put it up. But none of our other family members have any idea who we're talking about. Our parents and older siblings have no memory at all of Uncle Jojo. But they told my twin and I that as little kids, we used to inexplicably disappear. A lot. All the doors would be locked, yet we'd somehow get out of the house. They never could find us until we suddenly came wandering back hours later. They would even call the police when they couldn't find us. 
Then we'd just appear out of nowhere, knocking on the door, wanting to be let back in. Even if they had just been outside looking for us and we weren't there, once they were back in the house with the door closed, we'd suddenly appear on the other side, knocking. This all happened between the ages of four and eight. After that, we never saw him again. When we look at photos of family events that we know he was there for, he's not in any of them. And he should be in those photos, right between us. We have one where there's a weird gap right between where my brother and I are standing. There are too many weird things that make me think that maybe Uncle Jojo wasn't human. Some people theorize that he was a random guy from the neighborhood that no one remembers. But that doesn't explain how our parents could never find us when we disappeared from a locked house. Or how we got out of the house in the first place. How did we, at the age of four, manage to escape from a second-story bedroom of a locked house? Also, Uncle Jojo showed up to family events, but only we saw him, even back then. He always showed up on foot, too, never in a car, no matter how far outside of the city we were. During that time, our parents were fighting a lot, and our older brother had severe behavioral problems, so there was a lot of chaos in the house. My twin and I were considered the good kids of the family, so we were mostly left to our own devices. We spent a lot of time alone in that upstairs bedroom. Uncle Jojo was a really calming influence on us, though. He made us feel safe, but if we mentioned him to our parents, they brushed it off like we were making it all up. But he was real. My brother and I are now 14 years old, but we still remember Uncle Jojo very well. At the age of nine, our mom had us each write down a description of him, and they were almost identical. But the description didn't match anybody that our family knew. The last time we ever saw him was in December of 2014. He took us to the lake, and when we came back, my brother and I got really sick and almost had to be hospitalized. Mom said again we just randomly reappeared, soaking wet and knocking on the door to be let in. But she didn't question it because she was so happy just to have us back home. We also asked our parents and neighbors about the tire swing down by the lake. Nobody knows who put it up. They all say it just appeared there one day. And it's a really good quality swing, too. The person who put it up had to have known what they were doing. And my brother and I both remember helping Uncle Jojo put it up. We were like six years old, though, so we couldn't have helped him too much, but we clearly remember helping him. We both really miss him a lot. The other day, my brother was looking out the window and he said, Do you think if we jumped out and walked down to the lake, Uncle Jojo would be there? I don't think we've ever really moved on. We keep hoping he'll show up again. I had three supposedly imaginary friends when I was little. The main one was called Jenny Mogul, and the other two were Peavy and Jabby. When I was six years old, my niece was born, and when she became old enough to talk, she started talking to Jenny, and later to the other two as well. But I had never told her a thing about them. I never even mentioned their names. But she described them exactly as I saw them. I can relate, because I have memories of various people that my parents can't remember. I have three theories. One, my parents may have simply forgotten them, because these people were far more significant to me than to them. Two, they're false memories from very vivid dreams. And three, these are memories of people I knew in past lives. I was born in 1978, and when I was very young, I had two imaginary friends, Georgie and Mary. They were brother and sister. But the weird part is, they were from the 1950s. I have childhood memories that are only shared with one cousin. We both recall two big guard dogs that my parents owned. 
but my parents don't remember them at all. They owned a scrapyard, and they had two huge dogs named Sasha and Susie. They were vicious things that barked aggressively whenever you were next to their pen. I also remember them molting and looking pretty patchy and messy. It's now been 25 years, and my parents still have zero recollection of owning these dogs. My cousin and I just can't comprehend this, because we remember them clear as day. We had them for a long time, too. They had a pen in the back, and I remember Dad shoveling away their mess every morning. It feels so surreal to remember something so clearly, yet everyone else acts like it never existed. I'm really glad that my cousin remembers it the same way. Otherwise, I'd really start to question myself. I want to share an experience I had about a year ago. Back then, I was living with my now ex-girlfriend. We always had our paychecks direct deposited to our bank accounts around midnight every Thursday. I would then walk to the Circle K, use their ATM, take the cash out, and buy some groceries. Well, something happened one Thursday when I took that midnight walk to the ATM that changed my thinking about the paranormal forever. Because before that, I didn't believe in it. That night as I was walking to the store, I noticed that the street lights were off. The only light was coming from the houses that I was passing by. Something didn't feel right to me. It was like there was someone behind me, staring. It was very unnerving, but I made my way to the store anyway. I arrived, got the cash, bought some stuff, and headed back home. On the way home, I saw a boy around 10 years old riding his bike on the sidewalk. Since it was so late at night, I asked him where his parents were, but he just kept riding back and forth without answering me. I felt like I needed to do something about this. There's this kid outside, unsupervised, riding his bike late at night. Who knows what can happen? I kept asking him where his parents were, but he never responded. I almost called the cops. He kept riding along the sidewalk by a certain house. Then he'd stop and give me a look like he was in trouble. The lights were on at that house, so I decided to knock on the door, even though it was late, to see if it was their boy or if they knew who he was. After a little while, a woman cautiously opened the door and asked if she could help me. I said, I'm really sorry to bother you this late, but there's this kid riding a bike in front of your house right now. It's late and I'm kind of worried about him. I was wondering if he was your kid or if you knew who he was. She gave me a very cold look, then told me to leave or she'd call the cops, so I left. Now, here's where it got strange. The boy was now nowhere to be found. He had simply vanished. I thought maybe the kid was toying with me. As soon as I started walking away, though, an angry man came out of the house asking me why I had upset his wife. I told him I hadn't meant to upset anyone. I was just trying to find the parents of the boy on the bike, who seemed to be gone now. That stopped him dead in his tracks, and his demeanor changed. I'll never forget the look on his face, as he quietly explained that I must have seen the ghost of their son, who had died 30 years ago. He had been killed by a drunk driver while riding his bike on that very street, and he died instantly. At that point, I was freaking out. I apologized to the man, and I asked him to please apologize to his wife for me, too. He nodded and went back inside. So I left, scared and sad at the same time. As I got to the end of the street, I heard the boy on the bike again, and I started to cry. It was the saddest I've ever felt before. I still go to that store, but I've never seen the boy again. I told my ex about it, but she never believed me. She knew I didn't believe in the paranormal, so she thought I was just trying to scare her. After that night, though, I have a real respect for the dead, and I may end up seeing that boy again one day. Who knows? There's so much about this world that we don't understand. 
So being open to that fact and embracing it will stand you in good stead, both in life and death. Thank you so much for listening tonight and being part of my family of darkness. Click on the end screen if you want to continue hearing more stories like this so you can stay scared until we meet again, my friends.